this is a, a, just a, a, what you would say a grand opportunity uh, just to have Ken with us. Now, a little brief history. 25 years ago, at least, I get a phone call from a Methodist church in Auburn who I don't know. I don't know the person on the other end of the phone. And when the, the Methodists, because there are two sort of extreme camps in, Method in yes. Methodism, very liberal or very conservative, theologically speaking, I don't know who I'm talking to. And they said, we have this guy named Ken Needham. And he has an open night. Uh, would you like to come in and speak? I said, well, we don't have anything. You know, we don't have like midweek services at the time. But we have a home Bible study with nine people. He said, that's fine. So... Okay, well, we'll we'll give him a try. <laughs> I said, where would I know him from? Has he written a book? No, he hasn't written any books. Uh, he's with the Torchbearers. Didn't ring a bell. I didn't know about the Torchbearers until I mm -hmm. met Ken. Uh, I said, well, who's any associates? And they, the first words out of the guy's mouth was Alan Redpath. I just said, I want him <laughs> right now because I wasn't familiar with Ken. I didn't mm -hmm. know Alan. I never met him, but I heard a lot of recordings by him, and I read a couple of his books. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I, Calvary Chapel, by way of a movement anyway, or if you want to call it a denomination, even though it tries not to be one, it certainly is, um, <laughs> just absolutely loves Alan Redpath. So I thought, okay, that's a really good green flag. Let's have him come in. And then the moment he comes in, it's like he, when you left, you probably don't remember. You talked to so many people, but you, he informed me, you informed me, that the next time you come through, you give a call. And I'm thinking, why in the world would you want to come up here where nobody, no place? But when I got mm -hmm. to thinking about it, what a privilege and an honor it is, sorry, plug your ears and hum, uh, to have <laughs> Ken want to come up here and speak to us. You have to remember, like, who are we? And then you have to remember, well, who were the disciples? Mm -hmm. You know, they just uh, country folk or fishermen or what have you. And you guys are all disciples. You are here because you fulfill by God's calling and by your hearts just saying, I want to be able to do this. Nobody was coerced here into any form of leadership. And all of you are. You say, well, I'm not leading. No, you're washing feet, so you're leading. You know, you're in front of groups. You're leading. You're, you're, you're hauling bags of groceries. You're leading. You're organizing things. You're leading because you lead according to the gifts that God gave you. And that is why you're here. Now, there are people that I wish could be here that can't be. Well, Kathy can't be here. They called her into work, and so she'll be here Sunday morning. But she is, like, incredibly disappointed mm -hmm. that she can't be here. And there are others, too, that I wish were here. We have an extraordinary church where the people mm -hmm. that are here, uh, by and large, just love to serve Jesus. That's the deal. Mm -hmm. um, the expression that 10% of the people do 90% of the work in a particular church, that does not apply here. Rare occasions it might because, like, everybody's out of town or something. But the bottom line is that people here just serve Jesus. And by doing that, they serve the body. And so I'm just absolutely blessed that Ken could be here. Now, I'm going to have you stand up here, Ken, just for a uh, Come on over here. But you, this is... This is apparently the magic spot right there. So because of that, that guy right there. And don't, and don't move from there. Exactly. But you can move around, but he'll, he'll yeah. tell you. But uh, uh, he, you might see Jaron doing this or doing that mm. back there. So. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, um, Ken, you, um, you live in Kilkeel, Ireland, but you're originally from Yorkshire? Yeah. Yeah, so Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. So he's from England. And um, now... Do you have in your house a silver soccer ball? I do. Yeah. Sitting on your mantle. Would you tell us about your experiences with that sort of thing and how you ended up with that? <laughs> well, <clears throat> Yorkshire is the largest county in England, and there are several quite big cities <clears throat> and a number of good soccer teams. <clears throat> and um, I was living in, in, on the outskirts of the city of Sheffield where steel making was first discovered. <clears throat> and the steel industry grew up out of the iron industry, which grew up because there were seven rivers that flow off the mountains through the city and they had hammer ponds on them and they beat out the metal 
before other kinds of power were produced. <coughs> and so there's some very big factories. The one my dad worked in employed 80,000 personnel in one factory, and it wasn't the biggest one in town. <coughs> and those factories all had soccer teams. And our next door neighbor was captain uh, of the best of the soccer teams and that trophy was a works trophy and was given to him. And his wife hated polishing it and <laughs> she hated it even more when it wasn't polished. <coughs> and she was dying to get rid of it. And Yorkshire is the biggest county. And when I was 13 years old, I was chosen to play for the county at soccer. <coughs> and next door neighbor's wife thought this was a golden opportunity to get rid of it, so she gave it to me. <laughs> uh, I did play soccer to a fairly high level when I was in the army. Uh, <coughs> it was a time the draft was on. And uh, the army sent me to North Africa <coughs> and there were many military units around the Mediterranean. Uh, Army, Navy and Air Force. And because the draft was on, nearly all guys my age were in there somewhere. So the, the, the team from the collected units all around was a pretty good team and, and six of them played for the national teams. But that team played against some of the local countries. I was stationed in Libya, I played against Libya, played against Egypt, played against Morocco, <coughs> and that was the highest level of, of soccer that I ever played at. Hmm? Well, it's one that doesn't exist now, right half. It's kind of midfield connecting strategy developing role, yes. Mm -hmm. And I, uh -huh. I just, th that being the case now, um, first of all, he still climbs, or you probably will soon, mm. Sleeve Binion, which yeah. is this 2,400 foot high mountain behind his uh -huh. house, which I did one time, and I was telling Ken, coming down, I blew out both my knees. <laughs> so it just, you know, have been, no, this no, man has been an athlete, but <laughs> ended up coming to serve the Lord, which is, uh, we didn't <laughs> want you to, uh, want you to <laughs> do your testimony, but we have a limited amount of time yeah, here. Sure. Um, so <laughs> the only other thing I wanted to ask you was um, Cape and Ray. Yes. Would you, very briefly, because you want to get to your subject, tell us <laughs> about Cape and Ray, your relationship with it, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh -huh. what, what it means. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Cape Moraine is the name uh, of an area in which there is a building that Americans think is a castle. It looks a bit like a castle, but it isn't because it's got big windows and you don't have those in castles. <clears throat> but it, was, it has castellated things on the roof, etc. And uh, Ian Thomas uh, was going to be a missionary doctor. That was his aim. <clears throat> but the Second World War came along and interrupted that, and uh, he, he was married just before the outbreak of the war, <clears throat> and uh, served most of the war in Europe. There are some programs being screened by BBC uh, on the Tower of London, which you might have heard of, it's in London actually, <clears throat> and one of the items in there is a tablecloth. It's an unusual tablecloth because one of the more famous battles of the Second World War was called Monte Cassino. <coughs> and it was an Italian monastery, is an Italian monastery, sit, sitting on a rocky height, very easy to defend, and it had a German garrison defending it. And the Brits were trying to attack it and trying to capture it because they need to move on into take most of that of Italy. <coughs> and the, the battle lasted for three months, after which the German garrison surrendered and came out with a white flag, and there were twenty seven of them. They surrendered to the remnant of the British army, which was two. 
Ian Thomas and his Batman. <laughs> and there was no paper on which to sign the surrender document, so they used a tablecloth, and that's the tablecloth that's in the Tower of London. He was a military hero. I had never heard him speak of the war, ever. I didn't use it for sermon illustrations, nothing. Although he did behave like a military commander, I'd have to say. <laughs> <clears throat> which didn't give us a great relationship because, uh, in, in my view, having been in the army at a much lower level, military intelligence is an oxymoron. There's <laughs> not that thing. That means it's self-contradictory. Uh, when you join the army, they teach you to hate the enemy. And you have straw figures and you rush up with bayonet and slam it in and cheer and and, uh, and they teach you to hate the enemy. Uh, Ian was stationed in Germany uh, when the war ended and was there for another two years and he wrote home to his wife and he said, guess what? God loves Germans and we are going to which was really, really revolutionary uh, uh, because <coughs> everybody's talking about these evil Germans that are bombing London and all the rest of it. <coughs> God loves Germans, we're going to. And he adopted four teenage boys from Germany, uh, Germany and Austria, and they came and lived with his sons who were the same age. And they grew up and all became part of the staff of, of Cape Marie. Uh, he, he was converted as a boy of 12 at a Christian camp and he had this dream of owning a big permanent Christian camp where kids could come and have a great vacation and find Jesus. And he saw an advert for this big house with 40 bedrooms and 200 acres of ground and it was up for auction and he wrote to his wife and said, go to the auction. And he'd got a few friends to contribute some money. And he, he said, this is the ceiling, we can't go above this. And she went to the auction and the price bidding went above that level. <coughs> and the husband had told her, this is all the money we have, stop here. <coughs> but God said, no, go a bit further. So she did, and she bid a little bit more, and she got it. <coughs> the place was pretty much a wreck. There were rhododendrons growing inside the rooms, <laughs> and very few windows intact. And they, in 1947, they opened it as a, a teenage kind of camp, really. Uh, rock bottom prices and very rough conditions. The beds were straw palliasses that the kids would sleep on. <coughs> and the very first uh, summer, he got a letter <coughs> from the war office who were concerned about the Hitler youth. <coughs> and uh, the war office had this dream that these Hitler youth were still very anti-British, still very pro-Nazi, and still very capable of finding more young people and training them, and, and they wanted to diffuse this. So they picked out 12 different vacation programs with the idea that they would pay for groups of, of these German teenagers and young guys in their 20s to come over and have a month's vacation <coughs> and meet British people. Believing that because the British is so wonderful, once they knew what we were really like, they would lose their hostility and that would be the end of the problem. <laughs> and they picked out 12 vacation programs. Cape Marine was the only Christian one. And so <coughs> actually 36 Hitler Youth came and stayed at Cape Marais for a month in the summer of 1947. All 36 got saved. And they went back to Germany totally different. 
British intelligence, if that's not an oxymoron, uh, followed them and all the vacation programs to evaluate them. They decided the only successful program was Cape Moray. The following year, they dropped the other 11, but they sent three more groups to Cape Moray Hall. <coughs> So it began essentially not as a Bible school, but as a, as a, a teenage conference. <clears throat> there are some amazing stories from that I could keep you all day. But um, <clears throat> Ian was wondering what to do with the place in the winter because nobody had vacation and uh, oh, it was going to be a headache. They had staff for the summer. If they let them go, they'd have to train new staff the next year and the place would be unheated through the winter, etc. <coughs> and then he met a businessman, <coughs> actually a realtor, who ran boys clubs in his area and the two became friends and the other guy, Van Doren, his name is, uh, suggested the idea of a Bible school, basic information, just a six-month Bible-only course. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> uh, they decided to do that, and that opened in uh, October 1947. <clears throat> and there were 13 students. English. <laughs> and that was it. <clears throat> but the uh, Bible school grew out of there. Uh, th they now have 200 students, uh, which is capacity. Uh, when I was there myself as a student, when was that, 1961, 62, <clears throat> and there were 70 students, uh, 30 Brits and 40 foreigners. <laughs> and uh, it was a great time for me, I, I, huge learning time. Uh, <clears throat> there are now 20, actually 28 Cape Marais in 24 different countries, all running the same sort of program, all in beautiful prime tourist areas, all offering vacations in the, in the vacation weeks, summer, Christmas, New Year, Easter. <clears throat> and then school in between. It's a very uh, viable program financially because it means the place is full 51 weeks out of 52. And if you can't make that pay, then <laughs> there's something wrong. <clears throat> and uh, that's the Cape Moray story, really. Uh, Ian Thomas died uh, about uh, about ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Um, and he wrote the book. Yeah, on the saving life of Christ. That was his first book. Yes, his first yeah, book. yeah. And it's absolutely a Christian classic. And there yeah. were other books that he wrote too. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is something that Ken's been involved in. He's there. Like every time I turn around on Facebook, you're saying something about it, it seems. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's been exciting. Mm -hmm. Look, I want you to be able to get to the folks here, but I just wanted to say that as he wrote to me, this could be his last time in the States, not necessarily an absolute statement, mm -hmm. but I kind of characterized it to him. It's like the Apostle Ken talking to the Ephesian elders. And <laughs> even though he's not speaking out of the book of Acts, but uh, we want to hear from him and hopefully you will be back and mm -hmm. all things uh, work together for whatever God wants to do with that. So with that, let's pray and uh, okay. unleash this man. Mm -hmm. Father, thanks for blessing us. Thank you for Ken. Speak now to our hearts and give us ears to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> well, it's beginning to look as though I might be back because last night I was with Bob Huddleston at uh, Calvary Sacramento and he was upset that I only had one evening for him <laughs> and he tried very hard to pin me down to another visit so we'll see uh, <clears throat> the man I would like to talk to you about as a model for 
Christian ministry and leadership is Moses. He was born at a very inauspicious time, as I'm sure you know. It was toward the end of a 400-year period. 400 years is a long time in American history, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> 400 years during which God's people were slaves. And slaves to the mighty nation of Egypt. <clears throat> They were becoming so numerous. I mean, God had told them to go out and multiply, and they had done. They were very good at arithmetic. <laughs> and their numbers had increased to three million or thereabouts, <coughs> which was becoming too many for the Egyptians. And they didn't want to get rid of all of them, but they would like to limit the numbers. So <coughs> they ordered that every baby boy was to be executed at birth. And no doubt many of them were, but this one couple had faith in God and they decided that their baby boy was not going to be killed and they kept him alive and kept him hidden. And it's difficult to hide a baby, especially when both mom and dad are slaves. And they're not working in the house, they're working out in the fields, making bricks. How do you keep a baby hidden? Babies are not very cooperative usually, are they? When they're hungry, they're hungry. Whether they should be or not, doesn't matter to them. They're hungry and they want the world to know. And for three months, they managed to keep him hidden. At the end of that time, the baby's lungs were so de well developed, they couldn't keep him hidden anymore. He's going to be discovered. So they adopt a new strategy. <coughs> and uh, the baby has a brother who is three years old. Too old <coughs> to be kept in the dark. He could talk about his ba baby brother <clears throat> if he did that. So he had to know that they had to keep this on the wraps. He also had an older sister, and we don't know how old she was because women are sensitive on these issues, <laughs> and so the information isn't always given out. But she must be older than Erin, so we're assuming she's about six. <clears throat> and... The parents make a tiny boat out of reeds and uh, put their baby in it and put it floating in the backwater of the River Nile where the Egyptian noble women came to bathe every morning <coughs> and withdrew and left the baby there, trusting God that this was his plan. They left big sister Miriam to keep watch. <clears throat> and the Egyptian noble women came down and Moses right on cue started crying and they brought this crying baby to the princess and her maternal heart was stirred and she adopted the baby. <clears throat> but little Miriam had kept her six-year-old life on edge as she observed this and went to the princess and said, would you like me to find you a wet nurse who can feed this baby for you? Wouldn't take a rocket scientist to work out who that was going to be, would it? <coughs> and that was a very dangerous moment because it was this woman's father whose edict had been flouted and this baby kept alive, should be dead. And it was very dangerous, uh, but Little Miriam took her life in her hands to defend her baby brother. And so in some ways, Moses, as a baby, owned, owed a whole lot to big sister and big brother. <coughs> he is adopted by the princess. He grows up in the palace. 
Miriam and Aaron are still slaves, working seven days a week. No vacations, no Easter, no Christmas, no coffee breaks, a slave. No school. Moses gets the fanciest education available in the world, growing up in the palace of the wealthiest nation and most cultured nation. He has friends who are polished and, and uh, have leisure. He has the fanciest food available anywhere in the world. Miriam and Aaron make bricks. Did you ever think things were not quite fair in your family? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> you know, kid brother got a bigger piece of cake than you did. <laughs> she got chocolate. I didn't get chocolate. <laughs> if anybody ever had the right to feel somewhat um, underprivileged, it would be Miriam and Aaron, wouldn't it? So Moses is in the palace and he's growing up with this fancy education no doubt a dazzling future available. Here's all the entertainment that goes on in the palace and everything else. <coughs> and what does he do? We're told, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded this grace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, not, feeling, not fearing the king's anger. How old was he when he came to that decision? Apparently 40. Not a kid jumping to conclusions, but a man with an ideal perspective to evaluate life. Here are my people, dirty, ragged, ignorant, can't read, can't write, got nothing, live in nasty little hovels, and worked seven days a week at an extremely boring, tedious job. He had people in the palace, every kind of food, entertainment, culture, power, respect. But they're God's people and these are not. What do I want to be? And at the age of 40, from this perspective, he decided it'd be better to be a slave if you had to be one and be right with God than to have everything, everything that the world can offer if you're not right with God. Jesus would pick up on that idea and, and say, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? and loses his own soul. Having come to that decision, he now in his heart identifies with the Hebrews and not with the Egyptians. And he sees an Egyptian and uh, he is flogging a slave. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? 
the men said, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he remained for the next 40 years being a shepherd. And uh, being a shepherd was not a high-profile career. <laughs> Shepherds stank <laughs> because sheep stink. <clears throat> and they were very unpopular people. And it was a very low category career. And he's there for 40 years, so he's now 80. And I passed that landmark a year or two back. <laughs> but I know what it feels like to be 80. And I know what the rest of the world thinks of people in my category. <laughs> and they <clears throat> sort of... Uh, think that life ends at 50, really, if that's yeah. uh, as far as you can go. <clears throat> and it's time you moved out and let somebody else in and you're finished and all this. And <clears throat> this is what Moses is thinking about himself. He had zeal to serve God, which is why he killed the Egyptian and which is why he tries to separate these two fighting Hebrews. But he's serving God in the flesh. You think, trying to serve God in the flesh. <clears throat> and he's not really doing God's will. And the result is disaster. Yeah. He's killed one Egyptian, he has not delivered three million Hebrews. <clears throat> he is trying to exercise a good influence over his own people. <clears throat> they don't want him. They reject him. And now he goes to the land of Midian, which is um, picturesquely described in the King James Bible as the backside of the desert. <clears throat> and he's there for 40 years. And you kind of get ingrained into habits over a 40-year period if nothing changes. And he sees himself really as a failure. You know, I wanted to serve God. I made a total mess of it. Nothing good came out of my efforts. And he has settled down to being out of the picture. He can't go back into Egypt because he's a wanted murderer. Mission over. And when he passes 80, mission definitely over. <laughs> you know? And that's when God draws his attention. <clears throat> you might think that Moses is burned out. Just, you know, his own people don't want him. There's nothing he can do. His youth is gone. His energy is gone. Burn out. When God draws his attention through a burning bush, and the amazing thing about it is the bush is not burned out. Burning bushes were very common, but burning bushes that didn't burn out were very uncommon. And he sees a kind of revelation in this that it is possible to burn and not be burned out. And he stops and examines this. And there's a little curiosity in his old heart yet. And God speaks to him through the burning bush. I haven't finished with him, Moses. You are going to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses doesn't feel he's up to it. He says, you know, can't do it. <clears throat> but God insists. 
and he arranges a meeting between Aaron and Moses, kind of halfway between their two locations. They're to meet in the desert. <clears throat> and it must have been an interesting meeting. Moses is 80, Aaron is 83. <clears throat> and they haven't seen each other for 40 years, at least. <clears throat> How will they recognize each other? You know, people tend to change a bit in 40 years. <laughs> and it's quite possible they haven't really seen Aaron in 80 years. <laughs> and people definitely change in 80 years. <clears throat> but God brings them together and it's a very unlikely plan. And now these two octogenarians make their way back into Egypt and they go to the Hebrews. Now, what would you think if you were one of the Hebrews? And these two octogenarians come out of the desert and they say, we're going to rescue you <laughs> Sometimes God's plans look ridiculous, don't they? A baby born when there's a death sentence on all male babies, there's a chance it's going to survive. These two old guys coming out of the desert, what are they going to do? Oh, we're going to go to Pharaoh and tell him he's going to let you go and he's going to let you go. <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> but this is God's plan. Yeah. And actually, God is glorified through our weakness. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. <clears throat> and so these two old guys go into Pharaoh. Somehow or other, they get to see Pharaoh. And we aren't told how that happened. But, but, I mean, when did you just walk into, last, just walk into the president's office? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I've got an idea for you. <laughs> really. <laughs> But somehow they get past the security guards and uh, <clears throat> so Aaron is a slave who's run away. <clears throat> Moses is a wanted murderer. <laughs> and they go in to see Pharaoh and say, Hey, Pharaoh, <clears throat> listen to what God says. You are to let my people go. And Pharaoh is really not very impressed. Well, would you be? <coughs> God? Who are you talking about? I don't know him. I'm God around here. You obviously have too much time on your hands if you can sit around and dream up this kind of nonsense. We better occupy your time better. So you think you've got enough work to do? Well, obviously don't. So we'll just increase it a bit. We've been nice to you giving you straw to make bricks. Now you still to make the same number of bricks, but you get your own straw to do it with. And what was originally a heavy, toilsome burden is made worse. Sometimes when you start out to follow God's leading, things don't immediately get better. Sometimes they get worse. And you don't always get appreciation for what you're doing. Hey, Moses, life was bad enough before you came. What are you meddling with things for? <laughs> But if God's told you to go, you go, right? God didn't say it would be popular. 
So they go back to Pharaoh again and again and again. And every time a plague happens and they get worse and worse. <clears throat> and Pharaoh gets more and more upset. <clears throat> and Egypt gets poorer and poorer. But eventually, they leave. God rescues three million people through Moses <clears throat> and Aaron. And they go out to freedom. As they begin their journey, they're confronted by the Red Sea. <laughs> That's a funny way to bring us Moses. What are we going to do now? Pharaoh's coming after us with chariots and an army and there's a sea in front. There are no bridges and no boats and not one of us can swim. Slaves didn't get swimming lessons. <laughs> but God has arranged this. The sea doesn't surprise him. He knew it was there already. And he brought them that way because this is the way to really set them free. And he pulls back the ocean. Must have been by at least a mile to get three million people across in one day. And when the army try to follow, the waters return and wipe out the world's biggest army in a matter of minutes. God's power is revealed. And as we were going through the plagues, etc., you might have thought, why doesn't God just change Pharaoh's heart so he you know, just lets him go? Why prolong it like this? But we're told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And it's because we can see the contrast. We can see the contrast between a human king who is evil and the king of kings who is good. And in the showdown, there's only one winner. There's always only one winner. And it's always God. Doesn't matter how bad the odds look, God is on the throne. And they celebrate on the far shore of the Red Sea. They had one musical instrument for three million people. <laughs> Not a great worship team, uh, and uh, of course it's Miriam's tambourine, but three million people, although they had no songs. sang a song. They might still agree on the words and the tune, which is quite unusual in some churches. <laughs> and three million people praise God with one voice because for the very first time in their lives, they were free. For the first day after four centuries, this nation was free. God is never in a hurry. We tend to get in a hurry, especially if we're driving. <laughs> and we can get very impatient. God's never in a hurry. His plans are set. He knows what he's doing and when he's doing it, and he's going to do it. <clears throat> then they're in the desert for 40 years. <laughs> Moses is really old by this time. 120. The bush kept on burning for another 40 years. And you might think it's somebody else's turn now. You've done your bit. Well, maybe you've done that bit, but you've got another bit. <laughs> But I want us particularly 
to focus on the incident of the golden calf. <clears throat> and um, Moses has gone up the mountain to meet with God. Nobody else is allowed to touch the mountain. They've set, set up barricades at the base and everybody has to stay back. God says if even an animal sets foot on the mountain, stone it to death. Or if anybody does that, stone them to death. If you don't, I will break out in the judgment of fire amongst the whole nation. I'm a holy God. Sinful man needs to be obedient. You need to recognize this. You can't approach me in my holiness. Set the barricades and take three days total fast. No eating, no drinking, no sex. Why? It's psychological preparation to realize how significant this encounter is going to be. Moses goes up the mountain to meet with God. And he's there a long time, <laughs> 40 days again. <clears throat> and the people at the bottom of the mountain get restive. What's going on here? We've been here five days already. Six days already. Hey, Aaron, where's your brother? He is old, isn't he? Maybe he's got Alzheimer's. Maybe he's forgotten he's supposed to come back again. Or perhaps he's forgotten which way he's down. <coughs> Aaron, we never trusted your brother. He was never one of us. He grew up in that fancy palace with all those robes and everything. <coughs> but you are one of us. You know what life's really about. You be our leader. Forget your brother. And Aaron listens to the people. Doesn't listen to God. Listens to the people. Which is always dangerous. And he invites them to take off their earrings and he makes a golden calf. And then he says, this is the God that got you out of Egypt. Can you believe that? The thing can't even move now. It has no intellect doesn't know what's going on around it. That got you out of Egypt? How did that get you out of Egypt? But they believe it. Why do they believe it? Because they want to. A golden calf represents two things. Gold, of course, money. The calf was the strongest animal in nature for them. And they wanted a God that would make them rich and would be strong, make them strong. Perfect representation for God, right? Strength and riches. Well, there's one or two slight problems. The intellect isn't very great. <laughs> and bulls, are not very moral, are they? <laughs> you only need one to about 300 cows, so <laughs> not very moral. But then they weren't interested in the God's teaching or in his morals. They just wanted a God who would make them rich and strong. When you vote for a new president, what do you vote for? Mm. 
So three million people start to have a party. We've got us a new God. And the convenient thing about the golden calf is they can pick it up and turn it around, make it face any way they want. We all want a God like that. He'll do what we want, right? And God says, no, your business is to do what I want. You can't make me face whatever way seems right to you. <clears throat> and they indulge in revelry, which you can let your imagination loose on if you want. <clears throat> and there is this celebration and noise and music and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and Moses is getting to the end of his 40 days confrontation with God. He's going to receive, amongst other things, the Ten Commandments. How significant have they been in the history of the world? <clears throat> and then God says to Moses, Hey, Moses, your people have made them a golden calf. They're forgetting me, forgetting you. They're celebrating the calf. They're worshipping that. I'm going to wipe them out. We'll start again. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. They're a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. What a fantastic opportunity. Huh? God is telling Moses all his purposes are going to be fulfilled through Moses and his descendants. He'll be the most important man in the spiritual history of the world. So go down because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. O oh Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt? <laughs> God says to Moses, your people whom you brought out of Egypt. And Moses said, uh, your people whom you brought out of Egypt. What do you understand from that? Well, one thing you could understand is that neither God nor Moses wanted them. <laughs> <laughs> they're your people. Ah, they're your people. <clears throat> but there's something a bit more important you might understand. Whose people were they really? Whose church is this? Whose work is it? There's a huge relaxation that comes when you recognize the work is God's, not mine, not yours. When you think of it as my responsibility, it can be crushing. So where does the credit go? Your people, you brought, them, no, no, you brought them out of Egypt. I was there, God, but you did it. I stretched my little rod over the Red Sea, but you divided the ocean. I'm not stupid enough to think that holding a stick out over an ocean divides it. You know, it doesn't. <laughs> you did it. <clears throat> what did Jesus say? I will build my church. And this is the whole secret of Christian service. It is his work. He does it. It's our privilege just to be along for the ride. But we're not going to take the credit for what he's done, are we? 
And when you look back and see what is done, isn't it fantastic? When the Israelites could look back on their deliverance from Egypt, what a mighty God we have. What a faithful God. Promise that he given to Abraham 800 years before, fulfilled to the letter in the most unlikely of circumstances. God knows what he's doing. What a privilege to serve God like this. That's why we need to keep our eyes on him because then faith is kindled. Worship is born. When we take our eyes off him and look at the world around us, it's hopeless, really hopeless. When we look inside, I'm just a heap of ashes. I tried to serve God once, it was a total disaster. <clears throat> so we run the race looking unto Jesus. Faith is born as you look at Jesus. He inspires faith. Nothing is too difficult for him. And it's to be our privilege to take him into the world and let him loose to do whatever he wants to do. And whatever the job is, it's divine. It's serving the living God. And one day, we will see him face to face and I don't know about you, but I really want him to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Thank you.